contemporary John Downham called in his book, The Plea for the Poor, quote, a promiscuous generation who are all of kin, yet know no kindred, no house or home, no law, but their sensual lust, unquote. They have often resorted to intimidation, fraud, dissimulation, and all other similar forms of roguery to practice lawlessness and to commit acts of violence. In London, as well as in the rest of the country, roguery became so widespread that there developed among Elizabethan writers a literature of roguery. Especially Thomas Nash and Robert Greene were prolific writers of roguery pamphlets. In this regard, Green, whom Elton has described as a journalist of genius, has been referred to as the pamphleteer who, quote, both recorded and invented the traditional Elizabethan rogue in his pamphlets and on their practices, unquote. Actually, the word rogue, which seems to have been coined in the 1560s, was initially used in Elizabethan England, as uh, Craig Dunn and Steve Mens have explained, to quote, to describe vagrants who use disguise, rhetorical play, and the counterfeit gestures to insinuate themselves into lawful, social, and political contexts. And of course, today in our time, in Turkey, there are uh, millions of rogues. <laughs> basically, <laughs> basically, they were displaced figures poor men and women with no clear social place and identity. Uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, evet, uh, identity, unquote. However, this specific meaning was expanded in time so as to refer to, quote, a variety of social divines, deviants, and the uh, outcasts from rural migrants to urban con artists. To refer to, uh, Sorry, the word rock therefore came to be in Shakespeare to indicate villains, scoundrels, swindlers, atheists, double crossers, pimps, thugs, and all other kinds of social outcasts, whom Robert Greene called shifters and the cozeners. Yes, there we are. To these may, be, may also be added what Jeffrey Elton has described as the brawling soldier back from France and eager to spend his loot on drink and women, of whom Falstaff and his thugs become a grotesque representation in Shakespeare. In daily speech and slang, such social divines and outcasts were called, quote, moles, doxies, coney catchers, masterless men, and the caterpillars of the commonwealth, unquote. The Elizabethan criminal underworld was their social and cultural space in which they moved freely and displayed their identity. In other words, as Dion and the Mens have further pointed out, quote, the urban underworld became a semi-independent site of cultural meaning, an alternative to the court and the stage, a leading indicator of changes in English society. In this underworld, rogues develop their own language and codes of behavior and form fraternal bonds, sorry, and the social solidarity. Yeah. Uh, among themselves. As can be seen in Robert Greene's a notable discovery of Kozenich, now daily practiced by sundry lewd persons, published in 1591 which was one of his several slanderous and border pamphlets known as Connie Catching Pamphlets, there was a distinct rogue vocabulary which in fact constituted the rogue slang. For instance, a harlot or prostitute was called a traffic, while a customer deceived by a pimp was called a simpler. Similarly, an act of deceiving or a con game was referred to as... Uh, Yes, <laughs> referred to as a crossbite or crossbiting, just as a deceiver was a crossbiter. Biraz sıcak mı geldi bilmiyorum, çok terledim, evet. Right, uh, moreover, what Green called Connie catching was another example of the rock slang which in fact meant deceiving a person, such as a merchant, 
an artisan, an apprentice, a peasant, a traveler, a foreign visitor, of his money and belongings by various tricks and pretensions. Since the word coney or coney means a rabbit, it was, phrase, co it was a phrase coined out of the practice of tricking and trapping rabbits. Therefore, coney catching, especially in the history of literature, Renaissance literature, you've heard of this term. Indeed, by their ruffian behavior and moral laxity and unchecked tendency for crime, rogues defied the established norms and values of, quote, the self-fashioned gentleman who has traditionally been the literary focus and exemplar of the age. Yes. <clears throat> One may also add, sorry, in social and economic terms, they have been considered to be the products of the, quote, emerging economic and social changes under Elizabeth I. One may also add that the social ideals and the hierarchy of Elizabethan England and the values of the age have been challenged and subverted by rock culture and the values. The focal milieu of, rock, of the rock culture was pubs and alehouses, which not only functioned as venues for social gathering and interaction, <coughs> but also served various other purposes. Though in appearance a social setting, they were mostly the settings for violence, debauchery, and all sorts of trafficking. As uh, J.A. Sharp has stated, alehouses might be centers for receiving stolen goods, vagrants, vagrants lodged in them, they were often scenes of violence, prostitutes plied their trade in them, and they constituted an encouragement to poverty and the threat to family life. Yet they also offered the lower orders their sole recreational institution and moreover served a number of useful functions as pawn shops or labor exchanges, for example. In this regard, the tavern scenes in the first and the second parts of Henry IV become the most memorable and dramatically most vivid depiction of this Elizabethan world. If we recall Coleridge's remark in his lecture on Hamlet that Shakespeare, quote, never wrote anything without design, unquote, he may have intended through these scenes, Shakespeare, uh, intend through these scenes and low life types not only to cater for the groundings in, in the audience and stimulate their sense of belonging in this underworld, but also to create an awareness in the high and elite as regards the other and the other's subculture. <clears throat> yes. In fact, this is what Prince Hal, the future Henry V, has come to learn and associated himself with the social others of this subculture. Understandably, his father, King Henry IV, already in trouble with the war in the north, is worried about what he considered to be his son, Pr Prince Hal's delinquent and prodigal behavior, and his association with what he calls, quote, the rude society of London's underworld. Helpless because of Hall's uh, uh, pursuit of what he terms barren pleasures, motivated by the prince's, quote, inordinate and low desires, the king envies the Earl of Northumberland for having a loyal and brave son in Harry Percy, nicknamed Hotspur. In fact, Hall has deliberately grafted himself to this rude society of rogues, drunkards, and prostitutes. Actually, his aim has been to observe and learn about the ways of low life among the community and have a full and constructive experience of their world. He knows what he is doing and regards his underworld companionship as a temporary process of self-education for what he calls his reformation. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, uh, I have only a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, right. Indeed, once he has learned the ways of the world and the manners of the people, he will again be himself and reveal his royal uh, nobility, just like the sun shining most brightly after the clouds that have darkened it have dispersed. He stresses this point in his soliloquy, referring to Falstaff and his low life company. He says, I know you all, and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet herein will I imit imitate the sun who thus permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, 
he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mist of vapors and that it seemed to strangle him. So when this loose behavior I throw off and pay the debt I have never promised, by how much better than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify man's hopes. And like bright metal on a sullen ground, my reformation glittering over my fault shall show more goodly, attract more eyes than that which has no foil to set it off. I'll so offend to make offense a skill, redeeming time when men think least I will. So in this, uh, this world is a subcultural uh, space inhabited by exploited rogues and the drunkards and their doxies who speak in their own slang or more properly canting jargon exhibit a salacious and criminal behavior. Gathered around the drunken rogue and braggart knight Sir John Falstaff and preside over the social others of this world include the swaggering company of desperados, Bardolph, Gatchill, Poins, Pito, and Pistol, and also hostess quickly of the Boar's Head Tavern in Eastcheap and the prostitute doll Tearsheet. By presenting such a company of rogues and appropriating their jargon extensively, Shakespeare constructs in the first and second parts of Henry IV those scenes of robbery, brawls, drunkenness, promiscuity, bawdry, prostitution, criminality that give us an insight into his sociological reading of London's underworld. His rock jargon consists of sexual allusions and puns, swearing, cursing, slang phrase expression, slandering utterances, and the sarcastic references. Below is an amusing example of the subculture rock discourse uh, with the uh, so discourse with latent illusions of sexuality. In the dialogue, Falstaff, swaggering rock, comrade, and ensign pistol, whose name emblematically gestured to phallic associations, has dropped by to join his army captain Falstaff in Hostess Quickly's bar, uh, which is the gathering and feasting place for Falstaff, his rock company, and soon gets into a brawl with the hostess and her prostitute customer, Doll Tearsheet. Pistol. God save you, Sir John. Welcome, ancient pistol. Here, pistol, I charge you with a cup of sack. That must be a glass of beer, wine. Do you discharge upon my ho do you discharge upon my hostess? Pistol. I will discharge upon her, Sir John, with two bullets. Oh, she is pistol proof, sir. You shall not hardly offend her. Come, uh, I'll drink no proofs or no bullets. I'll drink no more than will do me good for no man's pleasure. Aye. Then to you, Mr. Storati, I will charge you. Charge me? I scorn you, scurvy companion. What, you poor, base, rascally, cheating, leg linen mate? Away, you moldy rock, away, I am meat for your master. I know you, Mr. Storati. Away, you cut purse rascal, you filthy bunk, away. By this wine, I'll trust my enough in your moldy chaps, and you play the saucy cuttle with me, away. You bottle ale, rascal, you basket hill stale juggler, you, since when, I pray you, sir, God's light with two points on your shoulder. Much. Though she may be a prostitute, dull tear sheet, whose name, metaphorically, the last page, uh, <laughs> metaphorically sums up her voluptuous and equally aggressive conduct, not only reveals her possession of dignity and self-respect, she's been you see, already uh, uh, cast aside, but also deconstruct pistols, cheap masculinity, and misogynistic attitude. Another scene with a similar gender issue takes place between hostess Quickly and Falstaff, who has exploited her to the extent that she is almost economically ruined and for years physically abused by him. Complaining to the security officer Fang, Hostess quickly explains with sexual quibbles how Falstaff has exploited her. Alas, the day, take heed of him. He stabbed me in my own house, stabbed. Most beastly in good faith. He cares not what mischief he does if his weapon be out. He will foil like any devil. He will spare neither man, woman, or nor child. Falstaff. In fact, one can infer from Dolsheet's uh, dignified defiance as hostess quickly stand against Falstaff's abuse of her that 
Shakespeare was not prejudiced against the low life women of the social underworld. On the contrary, he seems to have sympathized with them and implied that these women, who really were strong enough to survive among rogues and the cutthroat criminals, deserved respect and understanding. This may, of course, be considered an indication of Shakespeare's impeccable humanism and sense of freedom. In general terms, he, of course, subscribed to the social hierarchy class difference in his time, yet his approach to the underprivileged, the commonalty, the social others, never seems to have been motivated with hatred, contempt, or aversion arising from class discrimination or social otherness. Although in his plays, he teased them, mocked at them, described them as ludicrous types. So his rogues, drunkards, prostitutes, or criminal world in the first and second parts, Henry IV, and the measure, measure for measure, just like his peasants, shepherds, and artisans in his other plays, in As You Like It, or in Winter's Tale, or in, uh, uh, <coughs> in, in Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, arouse our sympathy and tolerance. To conclude then, as a resident, an observer, a dramatist, an enterpriser, an actor, and a playwright, Shakespeare was closely associated with the other London of rogues, drunkards, and prostitutes. It was in this social and morally uncouth environment that he practiced his art, made money, and attained fame. Thank you. <laughs>